All right, we're going to give you a whirlwind tour um, of occult spiritual warfare. There's so much we could say about this. Um, I'm just going to try and get your appetite whetted. This is an area that's um, it's definitely, <laughs> if you want to get into a growth industry, get into this. <laughs> because it's, it's definitely on the increase. Um, when we talk about occult level spiritual warfare, first of all, let's define our terms. What is the occult? Um, occult means of or relating to magic or astrology or any system claiming to use knowledge or secret or supernatural powers or agencies. So it's a pretty big category. Um, and it's beyond the range of ordinary powers or understanding. It can mean secret or communicated or disclosed only to the initiated. So it's kind of a hidden club. It's an exclusive club. There are a number of things that fall within it. We'll talk about that as we go. But to frame our conversation, let's take a look at Acts chapter 16. It says in Acts 16, uh, down in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, I'm saying it in kind of a stage voice, right? But if this were actually going on and you were walking down the street, it would have been way more disruptive and loud. These men are servants of the Most High God. They are telling you the way of salvation. And it, just going on and on and on. You can imagine what kind of disruption that would be. And so... Uh, this, this she kept doing for many days, not just once or twice. And so you could see this would really get on your nerves. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks." Well, this, this is a story about, as it says, a slave girl who has a spirit of divination. And the scripture is very clear it's a spirit. And we can extract from that that people who are capable of telling fortunes and that sort of thing, they're generally operating out of a spirit that gives them that ability. When I was a kid, I remember talking with my grandmother about this passage. And she said, oh, you know, that's all just a bunch of stuff nonsense and that sort of thing. But in those years, it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, in those years, you couldn't really find occult type activity, at least not in middle America. This is when I'm talking about dialoguing with my grandmother. This would have been in Michigan. And not just any part of Michigan, not Detroit, but western Michigan, which was still a very uh, holiness-oriented, Bible-centric, and if you weren't a Methodist, you were probably Dutch Reformed, and you might have been Baptist, and there were a few Catholics sprinkled around, but pretty much everybody went to church, and I mean everybody went to church. Sunday, everything was closed. If you needed anything uh, from the pharmacy, good luck, because most drug stores were closed. There were no supermarkets open. There, were no, there was no shopping available, because it was all closed. And if you really got in trouble, you went to the hospital because that would have still been open. And, of course, the police and firemen were on duty. But that was America, and I remember that America really well, really well. And I'm not saying we necessarily should return to that, but it gives you some idea of the impact of a faith-based society 
and it's in living memory. No one even talks about this anymore. But when we say, you know, America needs to come back to God, just think about that. So my grandmother said, well, this is nonsense. No, you know, nobody can do this. It's, huh. But um, I'm just, you know, looking around the room here, and I see Victoria Hernandez sitting on the front row. So Victoria is a good friend of mine, and we live in approximately the same part. Well, you've moved now, haven't you? You're, oh, you're still in Lamita. Okay. So we live in about the same part of town. And as you come down the hill from where I live, uh, there are, that I know of, five uh, astrologers, fortune tellers, something like this. They might have a sign up that says, Madam, somebody or other. There's a gigantic occultic bookshop, bigger than this whole sanctuary, that's uh, open. Just, again, come down the hill, take a left, and it's down about 200 yards. It's called the Psychic Eye. Um, this stuff is all around, and you may not be paying attention to it, but trust me, a lot of other people are. So um, there's the America that I described. There's the America that I just described, which is the more current America. And I remember hearing a talk that um, a woman named Elizabeth Shorey gave. And at the time, she was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church of the United States. And uh, she was talking about this story, but she was doing it in, of all places, Colombia. And she was saying in the, in the translated talk that this Paul, he's really showing his, his male dominance and the Western worldview. I mean, it's all laced with all that kind of you know, CRT type language. But his dominance, because he didn't recognize the spark of the divine in this poor slave girl, and he wanted to snuff it out because of his patriarchal religion. She literally said this. And then she was, you know, welcoming the Colombians to continue practicing their witchcraft and voodoo and other spiritually based society. But this is really clear, a spirit of divination. It's, a, it's an evil spirit that gives that ability. And then when he commands it to come out, it comes out. And then it says again when they realized the hope of money was gone because they knew where that power came from. So in societies that are not Christian, this sort of thing is very very common. And in Christian societies, if they're thoroughly Christianized, as the America that I described to you from my own childhood, again, I'm a living witness. I didn't read this in a magazine. I'm telling you what I lived. Um, in a society like that, these things are, well, I don't know about hunted down and exterminated, but they're pushed to the margins, and pretty much everyone understands, stay away from this. Don't do this because it's contrary to the ways of God, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So um, this is our slave girl, and then the other passage I want to take you to is also in the book of Acts. It's only a couple of chapters later. It's in Acts chapter 19. And in Acts 19, we have the account of what went on in Ephesus. Um, I'm going to skip the first few verses of 19. It's, it's important and significant, but one of the things you always are fighting when you're on a stage is time, and this is a way to save a little bit of it. So Paul comes to Ephesus. He finds, it says, about 12 men. That's, that's important, and it's Luke really cueing us that Paul's about to do something that's modeled after the ministry of Jesus because Jesus had 12 men. But in this case, it wasn't 12. It was about 12, so I don't know what that is, 10, 11? 13, 14, but you, you get the idea. It's, it's a handful. Um, and so they get the Holy Spirit, and out of that, a great revival breaks out as the Holy Spirit begins moving through these 12 who had heard about the gospel of salvation but didn't know about the gospel of the kingdom, didn't know about the gospel of power. And so Paul goes into the synagogue, and he begins to preach about the kingdom of God. That's really important, and it's in verse 8. He's not just preaching any old thing. He's preaching the kingdom of God, which is its own subject, um, but it, it's about the breakthrough power of God's invasion. That's really the best way I've come up with to articulate this, that when the Lord breaks in in this way, um, can, is there any Kleenex or anything around? I'm sorry, it's so hot, I'm sweating, and it's making my glasses slide off my face. It's not very elegant, but here we go. There. 
that'll probably do better. So he's preaching about the kingdom of God, which, again, Luke has already cued us that he's trying to emulate the ministry of Jesus. And what did Jesus preach about? The kingdom of God. It says right in Mark 1.15, after John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee saying, the time is fulfilled. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so with that, he begins to preach about the kingdom of God and all of the parables of Jesus. Every parable of Jesus is about the kingdom of God. So that's what Paul is preaching. And so there's a breakout that happens. And in two years, all the residents of Asia Minor hear about it because they have the right message. When you get off track, generally, I don't think the Lord feels any obligation to back a message that's a little bit off kilter. But when it's on target, then the Lord backs it up. So everybody hears about the, the kingdom of God. And as a byproduct, verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Okay, so everybody knew there were evil spirits. And if you leave America, we still have this kind of skepticism and residue about evil spirits. It's not uniform, though, and it's, um, it's breaking up. You know, within the Hollywood crowd, they're, they're quite sold out to this. And thus we see movies like Harry Potter or um, The Omen, which is a little older. And there have been some others that have come out of late uh, dealing with all of these matters of the occult. And so they try to invoke the name of Jesus and they end up getting beat up uh, by the demonized man because they have no authority to use that name. They're not in him, so they can't, they can't represent him. And so the deliverance fails, and this becomes known throughout the entire city. And so um, fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Why? Well, because it worked for Paul. It just didn't work for the pretenders. And so as a result of that, many of those who were now believers came. Note this. They were now believers. Now, a lot of times theologians want to say, well, you know, these weren't really Christians because, after all, how could they be Christians and have demons? And it says they were believers. So what's happened is they believed the message of the kingdom as Paul was preaching it, and now we're getting what I, I mean, you can choose other language if you like, but I call it second stage kingdom breakthrough. So we consolidate our wins at salvation, and now we go on to some sort of a sanctifying move of the Spirit to break people out of whatever the bondage is that they're caught in. And as it happens in Ephesus, they're in bondage to evil spirits that are under the rule of a dominion-level spirit named Artemis. She's the patron saint of the city. And they even have a big statue of her. And there's part of the conversation about that in this passage, chapter 19 of Acts, where all of the silversmiths are making a pretty good living because religious pilgrims like to buy tchotchkes. And that's true whether you go to Lourdes today or you go to you know, one of the other shrines, maybe in Mexico, go down and, and visit the Virgin of Guadalupe. Well, they're doing the same thing in Ephesus. It's the same behavior, just in a different context. In this case, it's Western Turkey today. And they're under the influence of a spirit named Artemis. So they come and they confess their practices and divulge them. Now, this means they're both acknowledging, but they're also kind of laying it out on the table, all that I've been into. And here's how the secret workings go. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts. Now, this isn't like, you know, I've got a table and I'm going to put a coin on it and make it disappear like at a kid's magic show. By the way, I'm not in favor of any of that either. But that's different from what we're talking about here. These are the black arts. This is very powerful witchcraft that they are involved in. And it's called the magic arts. They bring their books and they burn them in the sight of all. Why are they doing this? Because the Christians are Nazis and want to have a book burning. No, that's not right. That's what the left would have you believe. They're doing it because when you are deeply entrenched in something that is contrary to the ways of God and there's demonic power behind it, it is often the case that you have to get rid of the talismans, 
the books, the insignia, whatever it is that have held people bound to that thing that they are caught in. And so they burn the books and now the word of the Lord continues to increase and prevail mightily because all these believers are getting free. And not only that, the hold that Artemis, the ruling spirit, has had over the city is being broken down down here at the street level. And basically the demonic pyramid, you can look this up in Ephesians 6, uh, the way this thing works is at the, at the base level you have baseline evil spirits. I'm not saying that they're... Uh, not that they're weak or unimportant. I'm just saying the, the most common evil spirits that you'll run into, these are usually called rulers. That's what Paul calls them. And they have names like lust and drug addiction or tarot and uh, Artemis worship. So that's an authority. And then above it, there will be a ruler. Now, rulers, are they, they oversee clusters of authorities. And if you want to think of it this way, authorities are like privates and corporals. And rulers are like sergeants in an army. And so, the, you know, the sergeants keep the platoons together and keep things going. But when you move beyond that, you're now getting into the commissioned officer ranks. And the dominion level spirits are the commissioned officers. And dominions are not world spirits, but they are very, they're regional. And their region can vary quite a bit. I've, I've run into dominion level spirits in places like Taiwan, and they might comprise much of a city block, but maybe not even a city block. On the other hand, I've run into Dominion level spirits. We have ran into one in Central America a few years ago, and it ran from, it, it had Dominion from Central uh, Costa Rica all the way down into Northern Colombia and Venezuela. And when that thing was broken, the power of it was broken, we had a massive move of evangelism with, with literally hundreds of people coming to faith in the immediate aftermath for days in all the meetings we were leading. And a chain of volcanoes went active all the way from Central America into Northern South America, and there were earthquakes, and we had to get off the mountain where we were praying. So this story in Ephesus is also a story of the occult. <clears throat> the converts in Ephesus were under the influence of this spirit, Artemis. Her other name is Diana. And uh, she was more of a fertility goddess and the goddess of all living. And her, one of her other names was Rhea. And if you're familiar with the name Gaia, we get the name Gaia from the extract of this. So one of the big uh, trend lines that's going on in modern conversation about religion and do not think in the church. I mean, in the right part of the church, or maybe I should say the wrong part of the church, this is a thing there too. But in general, Christians aren't going here, but the wider society has gone back to worshiping the earth. And so a lot of what you see... Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Um, a lot of what you see in the modern media... Um, <laughs> how edgy do I want to be? Uh, a, lot of this, a lot of this stuff about save the earth and be green and get our carbon footprint down and all of this, if, you, if you're paying attention to it, sure they've got what they call as science undergirding a lot of it, but at the same time, if you listen to the conversation, you read some of the documents that are being released, Underneath it is a worldview that says the earth is alive and she um, is the mother of us all and we have to take care of her. And so there is literally a return to the worship of the earth and the fertility cults of old kind of strewn through there. But there is an updating. It de it's definitely not the same thing as you know, straight line Philistine religion or something. This is its own unique modern variant of it. But it has threads of it that are very, very similar to all of that. So when we, when we understand these two passages just from the New Testament, what we see is that there are evil spirits that control territories. Now, above the dominions, so I talked about authorities and rulers and then dominions, but there are also world spirits. 
And world spirits, they are known all over the world. So the queen of the seas is one of them. This, as it happens, is one of the uh, stage names for Saint Mary in the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not trying to take on Catholicism or offend anyone here, but why did Mary worship become such a big thing? And initially, by the way, it wasn't worship, but to be fair to, the, to our Catholic brothers and sisters, that wasn't what they were trying to do. They were simply trying to reverence the woman who gave birth to Jesus the Christ. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with recognizing that she was singled out by God with a unique mission, just as Samuel was miraculously born, or just as, I don't know, Jeremiah was called from his mother's womb. I don't think there's anything wrong with that and learning from her humility, her submission to God, etc. Where it becomes problematic, and if you've ever been down to Mexico and you've been to the shrine of the Virgin of Guadalupe, or you go to Mexico City and you go to the main cathedral right down in the center of the city, the stuff that you will see, I mean, it looks nearly identical to what you'll see in Hindu temples in India. And so, um, obviously, Jesus' name is sort of thrown around somewhere. But Jesus' name was being thrown around here in Ephesus too, wasn't it? Wasn't that what the exorcists were doing? And so, it's not enough just to put a few stickers on it and say, there, it's Christian. It's what's the substance of what's going on. And so, Queen of the Seas is one of the world spirits. Um, and there are also what we call archetypes. Archetypes are things that are behind whole trends in society. For example, drug addiction looks the same in Los Angeles as it does in London or Lisbon. You, you, you go into the certain part of town, you kind of know what it looks like. There's a certain furtive behavior. Uh, there's, a, there's a way the drugs affect the body. There's the, the whole mentality of people who are caught in drug use. That would be an example. We could look at some other things that are similarly um, at this level of spirits that are controlling regions. And what you understand is that when we're engaging in spiritual warfare, it has to go on on two levels, two levels. The one level is what we commonly do engaging with people in meetings like this one when the ministry time starts. Rob said to me, you know, we have a whole healing and deliverance team here at our church. Well, that's good, and you really need that. Because honestly, when you're dealing with societies that have departed from the ways of the Lord, there's not really any gospel receptivity. Paul says their minds are darkened. They can't receive the truth. And even if we preach it, there may not be breakthrough. So when people are coming to faith, we've got to break them out of whatever the stuff is that they're in. And there's a wide list of stuff. Today we're talking about the occult, so I'm not going to sit here and try and give you a laundry list. But, but bottom line, there are many, many behaviors and bondages that people can be caught in. And as try as they might, they can't just walk away from it. They can resist it, but it will continue coming at them until that power is broken and then they are able to walk away. So we've got that problem, but the other problem is what occurs at the higher level. And so when I come out here to the Inland Empire, from the South Bay as I did this morning, things feel differently out here than they do in the South Bay. I'm not saying the South Bay is better, it's cooler. <laughs> uh, so that's different. But, and I don't mean cool like, you know, cool, I mean like the temperature is lower. But, but there's a different feel out here. There are different concerns, there's a different vibe some of it's driven by the people and the demons they're carrying, and some of it's driven by the spirits that own this territory as opposed to those that own that territory over by the coast. The scripture says, and this comes from 1 John chapter 5, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So if we understand that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, then you can't even say that America is better than Mexico, or Mexico is better than El Salvador, or El Salvador is better than Colombia, or Colombia is better than Brazil. Because they're all lying in the power of the evil one. The only question is, which evil spirits, which deputies of his are in control of those areas? And the analogy that I think lays it out, although it's not as apt of an analogy as it was years ago, 
because people are largely forgetting World War II, and as a society, we've largely moved on from the sense of, I think, justifiable pride that our country had at the conclusion of World War II for having rescued the Earth, which we did. And people can say, oh, you're just caught in that American exceptionalism and racism. No, I'm caught in facts. Facts are stubborn things. And so if it hadn't been for the United States of America, the entire world would be speaking Japanese or German, and whatever freedoms we know would not be the case. And I assure you, a lot of the things that are, um, how do I want to say this diplomatically, widely trumpeted in our society, uh, those people would have been rounded up and gassed long ago or shot because those to societies that were on top, the, the Japanese and the Germans, they would have never, ever put up with what a free-thinking democratic society allows to go on. That's probably as diplomatic as I can be about that. So when we think about this, this wider venue, when, when the Allies went ashore in Normandy, this is 1944, so we're, we're not quite to 2024, but it's nearly 80 years ago. It's 78 years ago on June the 6th. The Allies went ashore in Normandy, and when they did, they opened a battle with Europe. They called it the Battle of Europe, and there were five specific landing beaches where they were trying to get armies on shore so they could consolidate, form up, and start fighting Hitler's armies, which were, well, for, for an amphibious landing force, the, Hitler's armies were better equipped. And in his order of the day, General Eisenhower said, your enemy will fight ferociously. He is battle-hardened and vicious. And that's exactly what they ran into um, at Omaha Beach, which was a US beach. There was one that the Brits had, the Australians, the Canadians. They each had a different name, code name. But at Omaha, we lost over 2,300 men trying to get onto the shore. And they were cut down by, mach by machine gun fire. But you know that was a sector that was under the control of one particular German general. And each section of the Normandy coast 200 miles of coast had a different general, maybe controlling 30 to 40 miles of it. So you had names like Erwin Rommel and von Rundstedt. Well, when I think of spiritual warfare, it's like that. There are generals in Satan's army, and the world lies in his power because those generals are controlling their sector. And when you go in and you try to preach the gospel, you better be ready for true spiritual warfare. One of the reasons so many missionaries flame out is they go to countries and they're like, yeah, I'm just here to preach the gospel and spiritual war, what spiritual? <laughs> and, you know, those people come home and I've had many, many, many prayer sessions with missionaries whose health is shattered, whose marriages are shattered, whose lives are shattered, whose mental health is gone, their children flipped out, they can't figure out why, and they're like, well, we just went to Burma to preach the gospel, and, well, this all happened to us. And I'm like, uh-huh, you stepped onto Omaha Beach. And in your case, it was von Rundstedt or, or, or Rommel or whichever other one, and so you just got cut to pieces. We better bring you into the field hospital and fix you up. So the warfare that you're going to engage in, and by the way, you don't need to go to Burma. You can be right here in Rancho Cucamonga. The warfare you're going to engage in is on two levels. There's the, there's the kind of tactical level where you're dealing with people that are the carriers of the authorities and rulers. And by the way, you will occasionally run into dominions and thrones because they too need lodgment. They too need a host, just like the authorities and rulers need a host. But they're a lot less common, and so the likelihood of any random Christian running into a dominion or a throne is reduced. It's not zero, and you do this long enough, sooner or later you're going to bump into some of this. It's just a question of who and when and how long. So you're going to go out and you're going to start preaching the gospel with signs and wonders, doing what Paul has been doing here in Acts 19 or earlier in Acts 16. You're going to do that. But at the same time, there will, be these, there will be these episodes of prayer, periods of prayer, where you actually need to pray for God to break things open. Now, there was a bunch of teaching that came out some years ago about how we go after these dominions and thrones, these high-level spirits. 
And I am aware that there are some people who seem to be gifted at this and they, they seem to be able to pull it off. Um, Cindy Jacobs is definitely in that camp. Uh, I think Becca Greenwood's in that camp. But most Christians should not be doing this. And here's the analogy I want to give you. Let's go back to a war fighting analogy. In the United States Navy, we've got a lot of very fine people, and they do whatever their jobs are. Some of them are cooks on board ships. It's a fairly you know, nonviolent role. You're just cooking the food and making sure everybody eats and cleaning up afterward. But an army or a navy marches on its stomach, so it's a super important function. And I don't mean to demean it in any way. I'm just saying that's what they do. Um, you've got guys that maybe work on submarines. I've got a friend who's the weapons officer on a 688-class attack sub, and he has the keys to the nuclear weapons, and you know whether it's a nuclear torpedo or whatever, uh, maybe a mine, 688s don't have missiles of the kind that you think of. Those are on different kind of submarine. Um, but that's what a weapons officer does. When the, when the commanding officer gives an order to fire, well, the weapons officer releases the weapons and fires them. You wouldn't be a modern warship if you didn't have a weapons officer who oversees that function. It's a central critical function. How about navigation? You better know where you're going, so you've got somebody on the bridge who does that. And we could go on. Let's, let's take another one that's really obvious to everybody, especially with the new Top Gun movie out. Maybe you're a fighter pilot. And, you know, you fly jets off of aircraft carriers. All right, that's a pretty important role, too. Keeps the fleet safe. Prevents, you know, incoming planes and other things from causing havoc. Everybody's got a function, and it's very, very important. And then when you run into somebody named Geronimo, codenamed Geronimo, which was what the CIA designated Osama bin Laden, and they identify him in a house in Abbottabad, Pakistan... Anybody see Zero Dark Thirty? Okay, you identify Geronimo in a house in Abbottabad. I don't want a weapons officer, and I also don't want a fighter pilot. I sure don't want the cook, and I don't need a navigation officer. None of them can do that job. I need a team called SEAL Team 6. And they're in the Navy, too. They don't know how to drive ships and fly planes. But when you need to go in and do some serious killing... That's what you need. And so in my mind, just as you would never send a pilot or a weapons officer or a cook or a navigation officer to go and take on Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad to insert in the middle of the night in some super secret helicopter, land, get in a firefight and kill him, and by the way, come out of that engagement with zero lost on the U.S. side, zero lost. And there's a whole movie about this. You can, you can watch the movie if you're interested in it. It's called Zero Dark Thirty. Um, well, when you need that, then that's what you need. And so, in my mind, there are people that do this kind of thing. I think Omar Cabrera in the um, South American revival in, in Argentina, he was another one who functioned this way. But by and large most people aren't supposed to be doing this. And if you are called to it, you will know. Someone will say, how do I know? If you're asking, you aren't called. I, I really mean it. If you're asking it, yeah, that's prima facie evidence this isn't your job. But there will be times, there will be times that even for the rank and file, they're not going to go after those high-level spirits, but those high-level spirits will come after them. And the model we see of that one is found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, it has a parallel account in uh, Matthew. But in Mark chapter 4, Jesus says, let's go across to the other side. And as they're going across, this wind whips up and the, the lake becomes unsafe. And his disciples, who are experienced fishermen from those waters, they are afraid they're going to drown. It's that bad of a storm. They wake him up. They say, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? And he says to them, where is your faith? So in other words, I expect you to be able to sort this out. He gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. That word in Greek only occurs in the Bible when you're dealing with demons. It's the only time it occurs. So these are demons that are attacking Jesus. And it's before he can get to the other side. As soon as he gets to the other side, 
the first thing that happens is the Gadarene demoniac, the man with 6,000 demons, shows up needing deliverance. So presumably, by inference, it doesn't explicitly state this, but presumably there was demonic intelligence that was trying to stop Jesus from getting there because they knew when he did, the fight was going to end and they were going to lose. And that's why Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. It isn't just some random, stop it, and now let's go work a miracle of the weather. It's, this is a strategic level engagement, but no, Jesus didn't start it. He's just in the boat asleep. And when the spirit attacks him, and I think, I think Legion was a dominion level spirit that had sway in this particular case, in Mark 4 and 5, over the entire district known as the Decapolis, which is a Greek word meaning ten cities. This is a confederation of cities that were in league with one another, very much modeled after ancient Sparta, which was a confederation of cities. And by the way, the Decapolis, I said, is a Greek name. They were all founded, all ten of those cities were founded by Alexander the Great, a Greek king and general. And so... That man legion, or that man with the spirit called legion, appears to have been the host of the dominion level spirit over all ten of the Decapolis. And after he is freed, Jesus says, don't come with me, I know you want to, but stay and tell everybody what God did for you. Because now this demonic covering has been blown off. And with it having been blown off through the deliverance of a man, not strategic level warfare, through the deliverance of a man, now that that has happened, the gospel can go forth. And thus, in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus returns, we now have 4,000 Gentiles, Greeks, who show up to hear the Jewish Messiah. And presumably, they all have their attendant women and their children. So I don't know how big that meeting was, but it might have easily been 16 20,000, figure for every man, a woman, that gets us from four to eight, and then however many children, I don't know, family sizes were bigger back then, but maybe 32,000 if it's four kids per family. I don't know, make your own assumptions about what the family size was, but you get the idea here. And so that becomes a model of warfare at, of this type as well. So we're talking about spirits that we deal with here, and we're talking about the ones that we deal with that are of a higher level, that are um, in the second heavens is the language that most people use. Now, just to clear the air on one point, and then we'll keep going. Um, in the book of Daniel, we have the account of Daniel praying, and ultimately Gabriel comes and he says, when you started to pray, I was immediately dispatched with an answer to your prayer. But it took me 21 days to get here because the prince of Persia opposed me. And there's been a lot of hay made of this. Uh, we can turn back to it and, and look at it if you'd like to do that. I think I still have my marker in Daniel from this morning. Yeah, there we go. So Daniel begins to pray and... Eventually, Gabriel brings an answer. This is all found in Daniel chapter 9. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the hill, holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, he'd seen Gabriel earlier in the book of Daniel. It was a different angelic visitation. He came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice and he made me to understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. And anyway, he talks about how the prince of Persia oppo opposed him. So the prince of Persia is not a world spirit. It's a dominion level spirit. But what do you think the territory is that it controls? Very good, Persia. Everybody gets a gold star. So the Bible's not that hard to understand, is it? Unless you have a hard heart or your eyes are blind and your ears are closed and you refuse to accept truth, which is the case with many people, including those that Jesus had to deal with. So many people say Daniel was warring against the prince of Persia. This is not correct. Daniel was praying and confessing the sins of his people 
and he was asking for an answer to something, and Gabriel gets dispatched. That's pretty good when Gabriel's sent to you. He's one of the four archangels. So, I mean, that's favor. But we already know Daniel was a righteous man, and I think part of why he had that kind of pull in heaven is the very stuff we were talking about this morning. You don't get one without the other. And so Gabriel comes and explains to him a bunch of things, and then uh, he mentions this prince of Persia. But Daniel's not actually warring against the prince of Persia. What's happening is his prayers, though, are empowering angelic armies, and as it happens... Our father looks down, he goes, hmm, Gabriel's not getting through. Looks like he needs a little help against the Prince of Persia. Hey, Michael, why don't you take three divisions of angels and go down there and just end this fight now? And so when Michael, the archangel who oversees the Jewish people, when he comes, boom. So it's an angelic war, but actually Daniel doesn't have any sense of what's going on about it. Or if he does, it's not clear from the pages of Scripture. It's just something that you know, maybe was he could sense it. And Gabriel explains everything to him. So no, Daniel is not engaging in strategic level warfare. SLW or SLSW, strategic level spiritual warfare. All right, so this is kind of our cosmology. This is our worldview. And as I say, from time to time, you may be drawn into situations where in prayer, we need to remove something in order to see something else occur. Um, I'll give you one other verse that I think is telling and quite interesting. If you go back to Isaiah, um, Isaiah says in chapter 25 and in verse 7, well, we'll go to verse 6 just to give it a little bit of context. In this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Well, which mountain is it talking about? The mountain of the house of the Lord. So it's talking about the Temple Mount, or maybe just diagonally across from it a mile or so away, Mount Sion, Mount Zion. And it says, And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. Now, what this is talking about is that demonic layer, and it's like a web or a net. When you talk to people that are true visionaries, intercessors, spiritual warfare people, many times they will describe this. I was in um, Knoxville, Tennessee over the 4th of July weekend. And of all things, I went to a large Messianic Jewish synagogue in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it was, it was a big meeting, and the Lord blew the place up, and it was great. Um, but it was funny. I had a guy traveling with me that I've known for years. He hasn't been able to travel with me for a while because they started a family, and he was busy being dad. But his wife let him come out and play. So we were driving over there, and he said, you know, I've talked to several friends that are intercessors in this region, meaning the far east of Tennessee, and they all say that there are three giant spirits that sit on these three mountains. I don't know the names of the other two. He told me, and I've forgotten them. But they're prominent high points, high places, uh, within that eastern Tennessee region. And then there's one called Lookout Mountain, and the state line between Tennessee and Georgia goes right through it. And, you know, it's a pretty tony neighborhood to live up on Lookout Mountain. And it's called Lookout Mountain because you can see a long way from up there. But anyway, he said, these intercessors have told me that between Lookout Mountain and these other two, that they always see this thing like a web or a net or some kind of something like that that is spread out over the whole area. And it's part of what makes Knoxville the most evil city in Tennessee. And I said, yeah, that'd be about right. And then I showed him this verse. And he's like, I had no idea that's in there. So again, we've got warfare on the ground, and then we've got what's going on in the in the heavens and I said so the Lord says he'll rend the net and in, in this particular passage it's referring to the ultimate rending in the final days of battle on the earth but I think there are regional breakthroughs I think the paradigm still holds and so you know some of them are praying not against the demons as much as that God would rend the net that he would here's a word and you would all recognize this phrasing, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. 
Well, split the sky, yes, but also pierce through that veil that is over Rancho Cucamonga or the Inland Empire and touch down that the power of God would be released, that the gospel would go forth. That's valid praying. And if you would do that, uh, maybe before you do your next evangelistic outreach, it could be that you would see a higher level of effectiveness. Way back before anybody was even teaching on strategic level warfare, um, there was a man named D.L. Moody. And he had an intercessor that he would send ahead to any place he was going to do a crusade. This was in the early 20th century. People didn't really have supernatural worldviews. But this guy would go and he would pray and labor that the Lord would break through. And then Moody would come and he would have these incredible harvests of people because of that power of intercession. So that's what's presupposed in our worldview. Now let's talk about the occult. Now the Old Testament strictly forbids the occult. Strictly forbids the occult. And... We live in a lawless age in which people want to throw aside what's in the scripture. And all I can say is, if you are throwing out the Old Testament, you are a fool. That's strong language, but I'll stand on it. Because it's the only Bible that Jesus and Paul had until Paul wrote half of the New Testament. And not only that, in the early church, they had several church councils in which they excommunicated globally anybody who didn't hold to the Old Testament. One of whom, by the way, was a man named Marcion, not like my favorite Martian, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. He came from this western part of Turkey, not too far from Ephesus. And, uh, and he said that the Old Testament didn't matter, that the God of the Old Testament was mean, and the God of the New Testament was a good God. Does this sound like stuff you're hearing today? Yeah, Greg Boyd has that going on. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Greg Boyd. I think he's a clown, but anyway. Um, not only that, he said that we shouldn't really go with the Gospel of John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke were okay. And most of the letters of Paul, but he was a little unsure of a couple of them. And then he threw out all of the Peter letters and all the John letters, and especially that thing called Revelation. Get rid of that, because that talks about an angry God with judgment and a lake of fire and all that stuff. And so the church got together and they're like, this guy, he's out. Because he's not actually preaching Christianity. And here's a reality that you may have never thought about. If you're a Christian, whatever your genetic tree tells you you came from, if you're a Christian, you're actually a Jew. You were grafted into the original tree. Now, it's really clear from Scripture that we don't need to follow Moses anymore. But that doesn't mean there's no wisdom in the Old Testament. And it also doesn't mean that there aren't things in the Old Testament that aren't paradigms or models of the way things really should be or the way they are. And so for people who say, ah, the Old Testament, that doesn't matter. I understand the Old Testament can be confusing. It's even older than the New Testament. It's written in Hebrew, which is, I would say, not the easiest language to master. I mean, like anything, you put your mind to it, you'll get there eventually. But it's not an easy language. And parts of the Old Testament are out of order. So you can't just read through it linearly and expect to get a sense of what's going on in the flow. By the way, if you'd like to do that, um, go get a copy of the One Year Bible Chronological Edition. You can buy it on Amazon for, I don't know, 15 bucks or something. It's probably gone up. Maybe it's 19 now. But anyway, get that and just start reading through the Bible the way they've reorganized everything chronologically. It'll have all the same material. It's just in the way it actually unfolds. And then things will make sense to you because A will, A will precede B and B will precede C. And you can get it in uh, NIV, which I don't recommend, or New King James, which is okay. What's that? Yeah. yeah, King James works too. But I like the New King James. It's a little cleaner to read for most modern Americans. Okay, so in the Old Testament, now that you know you're a Jew, whether or not you knew you were a Jew, <laughs> this means several things that you may have never thought about. But the first one is that you are called to be a strict monotheist. You are not allowed to engage in anything that approximates polytheism. 
And in fact, one of the big commandments that occurs over and over and over again in the pages of the New Testament is that we forsake idolatry. In fact, the entire 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, deals with the problem of idolatry and of them partaking of the feasts and sacrifices that were going on with regard to the Greek gods of the period. If you go to Corinth, I'm, I've been there, I've walked through the old city, I've been to the exact spot where Paul preached publicly, it's marked, they know where it is, there's no doubt about it. When you go down the main street of old Corinth and you see what's called the Forum, which was the marketplace, there are numerous little cubbies and cubicles and other things that are shrines where the people were worshiping all these gods. The Corinthians were coming out of that context and all they knew was that. And yet they'd been converted to Christianity. And this is why Paul says to them, now the first thing I want to tell you guys is that anyone who says Jesus is cursed is actually not speaking from the Holy Spirit. So you need to shut that down in your churches. In our churches today, many of them would say, oh, wow, cool. Yeah, there's a really powerful prophetic anointing. Well, there's a prophetic anointing, but it's not from the Lord. This would be analogous to that slave girl we looked at in Acts chapter 16. But here's another place that we'll need this verse anyway, so I'm going to go there right now. If you turn to Acts chapter 15... The church has gathered to debate, what are we going to do with all these Gentiles? They're coming in. Do they have to follow Moses? Do they have to be circumcised? I mean, what does it really mean for them to come in and join us? And so Acts chapter 15, verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. Bang, there it is. No idolatry. No polytheism. No worshiping other gods. Because if they're eating things that are polluted by idols, they are engaging in idol worship. That's part of how the game is played. You go to the feast and you eat the food. This is really, underneath it, part of the, the logic of what we have with the Lord's Supper. Because originally the Lord's Supper was a meal. And the people would come together and they would eat the meal. It was the Lord's meal. And then they would take communion because Jesus said, when you come together, eat this bread, drink this cup, you show my death until I come again. Where did he, where did he institute that? At a meal. And Paul makes the argument, I'm not going to go there, but you can check me on this. Mark, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, those who partake of the altar of an idol are engaging in worship of that idol. This, by the way, is when you get invited to your friend's Indian wedding. You should not be eating the meat at that wedding. Because guaranteed at that Indian wedding, they are worshiping, I don't know, Shiva or Brahma or whichever god or goddess is kind of, you know, favored in their home and in their family line and tradition. So you have to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, what's been strangled and from blood. And so these are the four main things. But don't think for a minute that it's as simple as it seems because there are layers underneath this that are clearly, clearly understood in the Old Testament. So these are summary statements. And each one has a whole package underneath it. Does this make sense? So when I say, well, let's all go to Rancho Cucamonga and attend church at Refuge. Okay, cool. So we all drive into the parking lot, we park our cars, and here we are. But what are we really doing? Well, this morning we worshiped for, I don't know what it was, an hour or 45 minutes or something. We had prayer ministry for people who needed prayer. Uh, we didn't take communion this morning, but then we took a break. A lot of us sat around and had lunch together, and those of you that didn't drove off campus and got some food and then came back here. And now we're hearing a seminar this afternoon on occult-level spiritual warfare. There's a lot of stuff going on with let's go to Refuge Church. Right? So when, when they summarize this, these are just what we call talking points. They're bullet points. But to those who are present and know what the substance of this conversation is about, this is way bigger than it at first appears. It's only four big key areas, I'll grant you that. But presupposed in all of this, 
since this is being run by a bunch of Orthodox Jews. Presupposed in all of this is a working understanding of the Old Testament. And when we bring it to the now, and we're talking about spiritual warfare in the now, there's a lot of stuff. I bet you, I bet you could swing a dead cat and run into a problem standing in this parking lot. No cat lovers get offended. That's just a saying that we used to use in the business community. The swing a dead cat means you don't have to go very far. From my house, you can swing a dead cat and find five, you know, soothsayers or astrologers or necromancers or whatever they are and one occultic bookshop by swinging a dead cat. Not literally. I mean, how far can you throw a dead cat? But, but within a couple of miles. And so... Come out of this parking lot, and I guarantee you, and if, if, you're, if you're spiritually attuned, if you dared to drive with your eyes closed, you could probably vector right into, oh, there's one right over there. Because you can feel the draw of it. That this is what these territorial spirits are doing. They're putting out, like, tractor beams, come to me. And so all around this area, even though you've got a lighthouse here, you've got there and there and there, and whether it's somebody's come and get a tarot card reading or a psychic bookshop or I mean well we had one woman in our church a, a while back I walked in one day you know I travel a lot um, but I walked in one day on a Sunday when I was home and a bunch of people come running up to me like oh Ken we're so glad you're here oh why is that well sister so-and-so uh, she lost her mind and no one can figure out what's wrong with her okay so, sister so-and-so is a Chinese woman, and her story was that she was married, she and her husband had a son, and she ended up divorcing her husband because he was sexually abusing their son. Well, that's a scriptural reason for divorce, so, okay, no harm, no foul as far as that goes, but being a good Christian syncretist, she decided to revert to her Chinese roots um, after about two years, and, you know, she'd gotten lonely and she wanted a new man. This is normal. Um, she drives up the 110 freeway from the South Bay to Chinatown in downtown Los Angeles. And when she gets to, she speaks fluent Chinese, when she gets to Chinatown, she goes and finds the local herbalist and talks with him a bit. And she says, you know, I'm looking for a man and I want to, I want to get married again, and so the herbalist gives her a bottle. It was a little smaller than this one, but he gives her a bottle with a potion in it that he had made up. You already know this isn't going anywhere good. <laughs> so she pays him the money, and he says, by the way, one thing you really want to be careful about, be sure that when you pick your man and you give this to him to drink, you are the very first thing he sees, because whatever he looks at, he will fall hopelessly, irrevocably in love. He'll never stray, but make sure that you're what he sees or he'll lock on to whatever that other thing is that he sees. So she takes the bottle home and she spends a couple of weeks thinking about, well, there's that guy and there's that guy. There's a, which one do I want? And how am I going to like have a meal with him and get him to drink this thing? And then she has the best idea she ever had, as if that was all not good enough, and I'm obviously being facetious. She says, I think I'm going to try it and drink some. So she pours some in a glass in her bathroom, knocks it back, and looks in the mirror. And does anyone know the story of narcissists? We get the word narcissist from it. It's a, it's a Greek legend about a man who saw his reflection in a pool, in a pond, and he fell hopelessly in love with himself. Well, she sees herself, falls in love with herself, and it's like, spring, you know, pew, springs her out of her ears, and there's smoke coming out of her ears, and pew, her head explodes. Not literally, but... And so now she's lost her mind and is unable to function, and she comes to church, and everyone's trying to figure her out, so I walk in and I said, hmm, this is interesting. When did this start? Well, you know, two weeks ago. 
Okay, and what was happening two weeks ago? Well, I went downtown and saw the Chinese herbalist, and I'd say, wait a minute, you did what? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, isn't this what all Christians do? Now, you're laughing, but this is where we are today. So I said, <clears throat> what did you do with this potion? Well, I brought it home and drank it and looked at myself. Okay, got it. Range to target, 1625 meters, come about to 117. Target acquisition and fire. <laughs> so we got rid of the evil spirits that had come in through the drinking of that potion. Was she in sin? Unquestionably. Was she a fool? Unquestionably. Is she paradigmatic of the way many modern Christians are? unquestionably Christians are going I'll give you another story we're talking about occult level spiritual warfare I ministered in a church in Huntington Beach California a Presbyterian church no less with a very godly spirit-filled pastor who is a close friend of mine and he had me in to do kind of a small group session for two days with his senior leadership team his deacons and his what they call session um, some of his trustees, the board. So we're all together, and they uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically have a very open culture. They, they'll share kind of anything among themselves. And so at one point in that couple of days, I'm talking to them, and this woman is sitting right down here on the front row, and it was a smaller room because there's only 30 of us or thereabouts. And I had a lower platform than this. It was just kind of a step. So this woman's sitting right here, and she kind of puts up her hand. She says, um, I have a confession to make. Okay, true confessions, what is it? And she says, well, I've been an elder in this church for 30 years. Uh, I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> and she says, during all of that time, there's not been a week that has gone by when I have not gone to the astrologer and the soothsayer to get my palm read two blocks down the street. And I turned to Gary and I said, you want to know why your church hasn't grown? This is what in military language we call the fifth column. It's an invasion inside the camp. Well, the Holy Spirit, I mean, no one even did anything. It was like, Almighty, almighty, this is the PBR street gang. And she's just laying there on the ground. No one even touched her. She confessed her sin, just like these people in Ephesus. She got hit with a Holy Spirit airstrike and was delivered of all of those spirits. Think about that. 30 years, 52 times a year. That's over 1,500 visits to the fortune teller, the astrologer, the medium, the whoever. Now, these are just two stories from here in Southern California. I could give you a bunch more, but I want you to see how prevalent this is, and I want you to know how prevalent it is. Now, let's give one other one. This is with a prominent church, I won't say where, here in California. And I, when COVID came, I started doing a lot of ministry with this church. Everyone in the room would know the name of it. And I was ministering among a lot of their leaders, lay leaders. We'd have these kind of smaller breakouts of 20 to 50. And then, uh, and then I was also doing a lot of ministry with their mid-level staff, not the senior most people, but the mid-level staff. That Unless you went to the church, you might not even know who these staff were. And... The staff weren't doing what I'm about to say, just so you let you know. But, but they did need ministry. But what I found among many of their lay leaders, I'll call them their senior lay leaders, maybe in some quarters they might have been called deacons or teaching leaders, pastors, teaching elders, things like that, whatever term they give them. A bunch of them, in pursuit of the prophetic had gone down to Costa Rica and Colombia. These are the two primary countries where this is going on. And they had gone to ayahuasca retreats. Does anyone here know what ayahuasca is? Ayahuasca is a tropical plant. 
you can Google it and they'll show you pictures of the leaves and so forth. It's one of the most powerful hallucinogens on the planet. And they mix it with another chemical which inhibits the metabolism of what's called DMT, and that's a short, uh, shortened acronym for dimethyl tryptase or something close to that. I, I'm slightly off on the name, but it's something like that. Again, you can look all this up. Um, but anyway, they'd gone to these retreats, and you can just Google ayahuasca retreat. By the way, don't go to one, okay? <laughs> this is just to confirm that I'm not giving you BS here. You can Google ayahuasca retreat, and they'll say, you know, fly down to Costa Rica, and for seven days or ten days, we're going to do yoga, and we're going to drink ayahuasca tea, and we're going to open the third eye, and you will have prophetic experiences, and you will see visions and angels and demons, and all this will come to you. And I'm telling you, people are flocking to South America and Central America to go on these retreats. I mean, it's a whole cottage industry. So back to this well-known church, there's all these leaders, again, not the senior leaders, but the, the kind of folk, but they honestly should have known better. They're going down there, and they're engaging in this. So there was about 25 of them that I had to cast demons out of them from getting involved in ayahuasca. The name of it is ayahuasca. And then there's a parallel spirit called Shakma, which is the god of fantasy and altered perception. So those two are the like biggies, but there could be some subsidiary stuff. Well, I did I did ten hours of yoga while I was in my ayahuasca trance. Okay, yoga, you got to go out too. And you know this is another thing. You try talking to Christians, especially in places like Nashville. I'm sure there's no problem with it in Rancho Cucamonga, but you go to Nashville, and I'm telling you, people will die in the ditch for their Christian yoga. And I think, do you understand what yoga is? It is the worship of Hindu gods. It is literally putting your body into prayer postures that those Hindu gods prescribed thousands of years ago in order to connect to the cosmic consciousness. And you're a Christian. You are uniting your body with a demon. And Paul calls that spiritual whoredom. And this is where the church is today. It's part of why we're powerless. And it's part of why things are going as they are. And when I say powerless, it's why we have no moral authority to speak into stuff that's going on around us in society. So back to the apostolic council. All of that's underneath this single prohibition against idolatry. But you may not have known it. And so there's a lot of things that are out there in the marketplace today. They appear safe, but they're not safe. The Freemasons. A lot of people think they're just a social service organization. The Mormons, which, by the way, came out of the Freemasons, but they have their own heresies, uh, including that Jesus and Satan are brothers and that Jesus is created. The Jehovah's Witnesses. I've cast spirits out of people called the Aryan spirit. Don't think Hitler and Aryan. That's A-R-Y-A-N. This one's A-R-I-A-N. The correct one that you want to cast. Well, you want to cast them both out but they're different spirits. The Aryan spirit's a racist spirit. The Aryan spirit I'm talking about is a spirit that denies Jesus is the Son of God and eternally coexistent with the Father as the creeds affirm and as I could prove to you from Scripture if that were my objective today. People who have engaged in a Reiki. When I was out in Pomona on Mother's Day, there was a few of you who came to that meeting. There was a woman who came up in the prayer line, wanted prayer from me, and I've since seen her and she's confirmed to me that she was completely set free. She came up in the prayer line, and I don't know why I even asked her, but she said she'd gone for a massage, and after that, she'd been having this excruciating pain coming down her left side all the way to her knee, and she could hardly walk, and it had been about two months. And I said, again, not characteristic for me to ask this sort of a question, but I said, um, by chance, did the person you went to, was that a Reiki practitioner? Yes, he was. He told me he was. I'm like, okay, contact, range to target, five meters. Right, headshot, <laughs> right? Um, I said, why did you let him work on you if he told you he was a Reiki practitioner? Well, he told me he was a Christian. He even showed me his Bible. Okay, what does Paul say? In your thinking, you need to become wise. And Christians today are naive about the realities of the occult. 
So Reiki is about energy field treatment, and it channels an evil spirit into you, allegedly to make you better, but in the devil's game, you either pay now or you pay later. If you pay now, that's one price. If you pay later, it's a bigger price because there's interest charged on it. It's kind of like your car loan or your credit card. So she had let this Reiki practitioner work on her, and she'd picked up a Reiki spirit, and I just said, look at me. So I took her hand, she looked me in the eye, and I commanded that Reiki spirit to come out. And as I did, she literally crumbled like this on her left side, crumbled, fell to her knees, and I said, it's running not only from your hip down, it's also coming up, and you've got a point of it right here in your trapezoid. She says, yes, that's right. So I commanded that thing to come out, and boom, she just falls out on the floor. Some of you were there and remember this happening. And like I said, I've seen her since uh, in a meeting that I led. And she was telling me that she's been completely fine. But she got that thing by going to a Reiki practitioner. So... All of this stuff that I'm describing about or describing to you, all of it, these are just examples to illustrate the teaching that I'm giving you, but all of it is off limits. All of it is a no fly zone, and you shouldn't be doing it. So there's a lot of stuff that appears harmless. Reiki is an example of that, acupuncture is another example of it. And I'm about to touch the third rail here, so my incinerated body. Just scrape up the ashes, Rob. <laughs> Chiropractic. Now, we're going to talk about that one in a moment, so I'm just going to leave that dangling there to hold your interest. So the occult is forbidden in Scripture. I want to run you through some Scriptures. We never read these publicly anymore. And if it means we go a little long today, that's what it means. But it's just so important that we get these things read out and on the record. Now, there's a couple I'm not going to read, and I have them designated in my notes. Don't read this one. Just reference it. So I'll give you these couple first that are references. You look them up yourself. Yes. <coughs> these others, <coughs> I'll take you through them. So in Exodus chapter 7, verse 11, the staff of Moses, which actually Aaron is carrying, when they throw it down, it turns into a snake. That's because God gave it as a sign that they had the authority of God to demand the Jews' release. And it says that the magicians and sorcerers, through their magic arts, their secret arts, same exact kind of language that we saw going on in Ephesus, only it's 20 centuries later when we're in Ephesus. They're able to make their staffs and rods turn into snakes. Hmm. Counterfeit miracles. And then in 722, the Nile turns to blood and they can do it too. False signs and lying wonders. And then in Exodus 8, 7, uh, the Moses and Aaron call for a plague of frogs, and the frogs come, and then the magicians and sorcerers, through their magic arts, also make frogs come. Now, after that, they can't keep up. So that's plagues 1, 2, and 3. Plagues 4 through 10, they can't do it. But Moses and Aaron can. So this is one thing we learn about the occult, is it's always fake, and it can never truly keep up with the power of God. But to Christians who are ill-equipped, to Christians who don't understand what they're really dealing with, sometimes the occult people actually outdo us. I remember being in Uganda a couple of years ago ahead of COVID, and I was, I was preaching in some meetings there, not, up, not too far from Kampala. And uh, we were at this pavilion on top of a hill, and this thing was... It was open to the air because it's tropical Africa and air conditioning is expensive and electricity is not that abundant, so you couldn't even run it anyway. So they built this thing with like a, a metal roof, corrugated metal roof, and there's, you know, pillars holding up the roof. But this thing seats about 4,000 people. So we're in this pavilion, and I'm on in the, the stage with a couple of the brothers from Africa, and we're preaching, and all of a sudden... All of a sudden, 16 witch doctors walk in in full battle rattle. 
They got the nose bone. They got the you know bones down the in a chest plate type thing. They're shaking shrunken heads. They're chanting and doing their thing. And they, this place has four aisles too. One, two, three, four aisles. Except these were way longer, and they were kind of came down to an open ministry area at the front, a little wider than this one. And as they come down, all the people are they're they're backing up, screaming and fleeing because they're terrified of these guys and their power. They know what this thing is. And I'm looking at the African guys, and I'm thinking, okay, game's on. And I'm like, Lord, what do you want us to do with this thing? As they enter into this open area right at the front, boom, 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 four groups of four, it's like they hit a force field. And they couldn't get through. And then it was like a hand came, and they were just smashed to the ground. Boom! Fourteen of them are almost instantaneously delivered of their evil spirits, but two of them are not. So the prayer team rushes up on the other two, and they work them for a while. And when they get them set free, they take all 16 of them out, and there's a tub of water just outside the pavilion. They all get baptized. But that's the occult, too. And there is a level of power encounter that looks like that, and we see something suggesting that, although different dynamics and particulars in the story of the rod, the Nile turning to blood, and the frogs. But now, let's go to Exodus chapter 22, and this one I'm going to read to you. In Exodus chapter 22, it says, you shall not permit a sorcerer or a sorceress to live. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. Because God does not want this among his people. And by the way, in case you think that's a little too intense, right behind it, whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. This is a strict no-fly zone on bestiality. Let me tell you, bestiality is a thing, and it's actually a growing phenomenon in our culture because many people are not marrying, and so they have pets, and I'll just leave it at that. Trust me, I've done a lot of deliverance over bestiality in people. And then right behind it, verse 20, whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. Now, we don't put people to death anymore. Don't worry, I'm not advocating for that. But I am showing you from these passages, these three verses, that God is, no pun intended, deadly serious about this. And so this idea of engaging in anything having to do with the occult, sorcery, black magic, reiki, energy fields, tarot cards any of it, all of it, the penalty was death. And here's something I've learned. I learned this. This is battlefield intelligence. I can't show you a scripture that says this. I've just found it to be very true. When people engage in these things now in the new covenant, again, we're not going to kill them, but it it is essentially universally the case that when somebody has been involved in occultic activity, or for that matter, bestiality or going away to other gods, there is always a spirit of death there. And that spirit of death will begin working its evil effects within the body of that person, sometimes in the mind of that person, and it will, it will seek to bring them to a, a premature death. And in the aftermath of that, it might be 10 years later, but they will often have bizarre and strange health stuff going on and so one of the things when I run into people that have you know premature death type stuff I'll always ask them did you ever engage in any kind of occultic anything and a lot of times they don't even know what I mean so I have to explain it I ask them about any involvement with idolatry did you ever go off to an Hindu ashram were you ever involved in eating mushrooms and cosmic consciousness you know back in the hippie days things like that you'd be surprised how often you run into it And then you can, now that it's been uncovered, you can confess it and drive out the evil spirits associated with it. Now let's go to the book of Leviticus. And remember, these are all passages and uh, things that Jesus and Paul would have both known. And I actually think um, that part of what Jesus did was they started ignoring all this stuff too by his time. And I think he brought all these things back to life and showed them the power of it. And it was foundational to his ministry of getting people free. And that's why they're like, wow, a new teaching with authority. And even the demons listened to him. Well, that's right. Okay, Leviticus 19.31. 
Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Did you catch that word unclean? What are evil spirits most commonly called in the New Testament? Thank you. They're a special class of evil spirit, and they commonly arise from this kind of activity. By the way, just fun fact, if you move up uh, to verse 26, so we're going backward here, you shall not eat flesh with any blood in it. Do you remember the stricture from Acts chapter 15 that I showed you? No eating of blood. Did you catch that when we looked at it in Acts 15? Ah, uh, here it is in Leviticus. So the Old and the New Testament are identical on this point. No eating of blood. Now this isn't an occult thing, but if you come out of a German or a Czech or an East Asian society where blood is routinely eaten, you probably need deliverance from that blood. And by the way, people who do it often have major digestive problems, things that today we call irritable bowel and gluten intolerance and leaky gut and all that. Get delivered of that stuff and more than likely your problem's going to go away. There, there can be another layer of, of stuff, and I'm not really here to teach on that right now. But since we're here, I'm just throwing it in as a fun fact. Because what's happening in America? Food allergies are exploding. When I was a kid, nobody knew what a food allergy was. But remember, I told you that was a society where people feared the Lord. We kept the Sabbath sacred. Sunday, really. But anyway, we honored the Lord's day. People didn't go to necromancers and people like that. <clears throat> Okay, so it says, you shall not eat blood, uh, any flesh with blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Hello? There it is. And by the way, you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or not because of or tattoo yourselves. Hello, America. Are you listening? <laughs> okay, I am the Lord. When he says, I am the Lord, what's he saying? He's actually saying, don't cross me on this. This is like when your mom says, when you're older, you'll understand, but don't ask me about it right now. Just do as I say. Because in those days, they didn't have the blood of Jesus. They didn't know what to do with all the stuff that they'd gotten themselves into. So the Lord just said, stay clear of it. That's the only hope you have, because there won't be a Jesus for about 1,500 years. And then he says, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. What did we do in the 1960s? The sexual revolution. And with it came a flood of pornography, and with it came the breakdown of marriage, and many young girls and women were mishandled, misused. Their barriers, their walls were broken down. I mean, I could give you a whole teaching on this one alone. But their, their walls were broken down, and today we have what amounts to open prostitution in America. It's called pornography. Pornography actually means the art of prostitutes. That is literally what that word means. So these are all young women, or nowadays young men too, who have had their barriers and their boundaries violated. They don't have any sense of right or wrong. They have no sense of self-worth. Remember I talked about that when I was speaking of Daniel? And so the land in America has become full of depravity to the point now that we are endorsing things that God says are an abomination. That is at the root. There's a bigger story, but we don't have time for it. That's at the root of the, of the uh, explosion of homosexuality and transgenderism that's going on in our country. Right there. It goes back to the 60s. So if you were part of that sexual revolution and you walked in those ways of immorality you probably need some help, some serious deliverance help from all of the immorality that happened back then. It was 60 years ago, or 55, or whatever the number is, but, but we're reaping the whirlwind. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He who sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap destruction. He who sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap eternal life. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. Here we go, verse 31, which is where I really wanted to get to. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers and seek them out, and thereby make yourself unclean. So Leviticus 19 is a gold mine in terms of understanding some of the demonization dynamics. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6. If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them. That's really strong language. 
You're a spiritual whore if you're doing that. And why is it whoring? Because you're uniting the body of Jesus with that other thing, and you're not supposed to do it. I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. There's where the spirit of death is in operation when people get into this stuff. Verse 27 of the same chapter. A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Why? I don't even want you touching them. Why? Because often when people die, their evil spirits will jump on the closest person. So if you're throwing rocks at them, you're far enough away, you're outside the contamination zone. These are the spiritual dynamics that are going on in these passages. Now, you're going to have people walking into your church, this church, and they're contaminated because they went to that astrologer or that card reader, or they went into downtown L.A. to Chinatown and they found an herbalist, or they went down to Costa Rica and they went to an ayahuasca retreat, or, 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 or. And so you will absolutely be running into this in our time. And until we get the great and shining revival, this is going to get worse, not better. And I can tell you, I started saying about mm, probably seven or eight years ago, there's a great wave of deliverance coming. But the main reason is because there's a great wave of demons coming. Yeah. And it's the only way to deal with them. So God sets his face against those who engage in the occult. Let's look at a couple of others. Deuteronomy chapter 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. So God actually allows this stuff to rise up in our midst to see what will we do with it. He doesn't, he doesn't tempt us, but he tests us. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he taught this rebellion against the Lord your God. So... Whether it's because they're saying, let's advocate for that God, and we could put any God in there. It could be Baal, or it might be Allah. But let's go follow that God. That is as bad in God's eyes as seeking the dead or going to a spiritualist or medium. And again, the penalty is death. We're not going to put people to death. Nobody needs to worry about that. And NSA, wherever you are listening in, don't worry, we're not advocating any kind of mass slaughter here. But there will be a spirit of death that will come over that individual. And it's right here in the pages of Scripture. And then it goes on and it says, even if your brother or your mother or your son or your daughter or your wife does this, you, you are to make sure that they are put out of the community and killed because of what it will do. It will contaminate a society. Is that happening in our world today? Yeah. Unquestionably, it is happening. And in fact, we're celebrating it. John, it was just about two years ago that the Church of Satan received full recognition as a valid religion within the U.S. Armed Forces. Yeah. This, yeah. <laughs> I heard someone say, what? Yeah. That's how bad it's gotten. All right, then let's look at Deuteronomy 18. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to be looking at verse 9 and following. Of course, I overshot. There we go. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer. Necromancer means one who communicates with the dead, or who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, watch this, the Lord is driving them out before you. What? Wait a minute. The Lord drove those nations out because of their occult practices. America should be very worried. 
very worried. We could lose this country on this one issue. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. All right, well, it doesn't really need much commentary. We ought not to be doing it, and yet it's going on, and Christians are doing it too. 1 Samuel 28, verses 6 to 19, I'm not going to read, <clears throat> but it's the story of one medium who had been left alive in Israel when Saul purged the land of mediums, and she conjures up Samuel. And there's nothing about that passage that suggests this is a good thing or that it should even be going on. It did go on, but it shouldn't have. And Samuel says to Saul, you will be with me as a shade among the dead tomorrow because you have done this. You have crossed a line and you know the commandments of the Lord. All this stuff we've just read was well known to Saul, later on to David and all the kings of Israel. And some of the kings actually began practicing it, including most notably Manasseh, 2 Kings 21 verses 5 and 6. I'm not turning there, but it says in the scripture that because of Manasseh's sin, that was when the Lord drew the line. He put up with a lot of the nonsense that the Jews engaged in, including even their idolatry. But when Manasseh got into the occult, that was when God said, that's it, this is the end. And so Manasseh has a son named uh, Asa. No, not Asa. Um, yeah, I can't think of it. He, he reigned two years, and then comes Josiah, the reformer. After Josiah's reform, though, in 25 years, Israel ceased to be. Judah was wiped out by the Babylonians, and it was all because of what Manasseh did. So there can be a long fuse on this stuff. So do we need to engage in occult warfare? Yes, we need to cleanse the land. We need to pray for these houses of necromancy and fortune-telling and the occult bookshops to shut. Has anyone been into a Barnes & Noble lately? If you walk into a bricks and mortar Barnes and Noble, the entire front of the store is laden with all manner of occult and witchcraft books. It's absolutely shocking. So this is where we are going. And like I said, there's a long fuse. Manasseh lived 52 years. His son, that I can't remember his name, lived two years. That's 54. And then Josiah ruled for, I'm drawing blank, 16 years, I think. Um, so... We get, a, we get up near 40 years, and then after Josiah, 25 years, and it's done. That's two generations. We're in the 60s of years. When did the sexual revolution begin in the United States? 67, summer of love. When you come to San Francisco, be sure to wear the flowers in your hair. When you wore the flowers in your hair, it meant I'm available. And we had Woodstock in the summer of 67. And a friend of mine, comma, a vineyard pastor, comma, conceived her first child at Woodstock. She found some guy, lifted up her dress, laid down on the grass, and they went for it right there in public. She got pregnant, but in 69, we didn't have Roe v. Wade, which, by the way, was the societal solution to all of the spawn that was coming out of all the immorality that was unleashed in the 1960s. No one ever thinks about that. And so she went ahead and had this kid, raised him, became a Christian, loved him. In the end, it's a better ending. But, but bottom line, this is what was going on. So it's about 60-ish years, 65 or so, from Manasseh to the destruction of Jerusalem, and we are just about 60 years from the beginning of the sexual revolution in America. America should be worried, and we need to be engaging in occult warfare, because here's the thing. Sexual immorality and all of this occult stuff they are always juxtaposed throughout the Old Testament. Why? Because if you're doing one, you're probably doing the other. When Josiah cleansed the temple during his reform, 2 Kings 23, there were all kinds of occult devices found in the temple, and so he took them out and burned them, just like the books in Ephesus, in the Kidron Valley. That's 2 Kings 23, 4, and 5. Here's some stuff out of Isaiah, specifically out of Isaiah, addressing these matters. Isaiah chapter 8 says this. 
Verse 19, when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. So what is this saying? That in Isaiah's day, and Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of a couple of pretty good kings, Hezekiah, Uzziah, but in Isaiah's day, this phenomenon was going on throughout Israel. They had mingled occult behavior with the proper exercise of Jewish religion, and Isaiah calls it out as something that ought not to be going on. In Isaiah 19, verse 3, the essence of Egyptian religion was idolatry, sorcery, mediumship, and necromancy, these four things. That's the essence of Egyptian religion. And, you know, it's interesting. If you ever go to one of these, like, fairs, um, I mean, it could be the Pomona Fair, but generally they call them psychic fairs or New Age fairs. One of the most popular things that you will see is Egyptian paraphernalia and hieroglyphics and phoenix birds and stuff like that. Well, the essence of Egyptian religion, as I said, was idolatry, sorcery, mediumship, communicating with the dead, and necromancy, a different form of it, <clears throat> communicating with the dead. That's Isaiah 19.3. In Isaiah 47, 12 and 13, he says that Babylonian religion was, in ba was based in enchantment, sorcery, and astrology. Well, that sounds surprisingly similar to the very stuff Daniel, whom we spoke of this morning, the very stuff he did not want to be part of. So Daniel was listening to Isaiah because Isaiah was before him, and he'd taken on board these key seminal teachings out of the prophetic literature. Isaiah 65, 4, this is particularly true for people who come from African backgrounds, Asian backgrounds, or Native American backgrounds. I'm not saying it can't go on in other cultures, but it's, these, are, these are hallmark features in those three broad sectors of society. And yes, I'm aware not all Africa is one tribe, and not all of Asia is one tribe. I'm just talking about big ethnic groups that have similarities. Isaiah 65, 4, necromancy and ancestor worship are forbidden. And in all three of those big clusters, black society, Asian society, as well as Native American society, ancestor worship is a gigantic thing. That, too, is occultic. And then in uh, Jeremiah 8, Jeremiah says we're not to bow down to the, to the heavenly bodies. Jeremiah 8, too. It's very interesting to me. I've always had an interest in astronomy, um, but... Because we all have Google on our devices now, and because I've always had an interest in astronomy, not astrology, um, you know, with, with all the stuff that's going on with the James Webb Space Telescope and before that Hubble, every now and then I like to just see what's going on in space, you know, because we got all this equipment up there now and they're making all these discoveries. And it's been really fascinating to me, in particular, just in the last about a month since the James Webb telescope turned on. There's like this breathless expectation. Now they're talking about sending robots to, those, to the cold oceans of Jupiter and Saturn to swim around and find life there. And they had a spectrographic scan that came back from a planet that orbits a star 7,500 light years away. Just to be clear, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. So it's 7,500 of those away. Um, but they can see this spectrum, and it appears that there's water in the upper atmosphere of that planet. And so they haven't found water anywhere else. And so they breathlessly declared, we have found life on other planets. No, we have not found life on other planets. We have found what appears to be the radio signature of water, but it's a long jump from water to life. But with all of this, there is starting to develop this thing of the aliens, and they're coming, and they're going to announce themselves to us, and there's this whole meme in that community that is, frankly, pretty distressing. Jeremiah says, don't bow down and worship the heavenly bodies. Don't become obsessed with all of this. It's the Lord we serve, and we're the crown of his creation, not some alien from Alpha Centauri. 
All right, Jeremiah even says in Jeremiah 19.13, there is a payback that will come upon you for worshiping the heavenly host. And it can include insanity. It can also include your health. You can check it yourself. Jeremiah 19.13. Well, there's a couple of others we could point to, but that's probably enough. So what are occult practices that you might run into? Alchemy is one. Now, I used to think that alchemy was just some relic of the Middle Ages, and it was you know, one of those myths and legends that people pursued. And I think it was five years ago, I was in the gold mining country of Australia, and this woman came to the meeting, and when the spirit started moving, she manifested like I've never seen. And everybody kind of backed away from her, so of course it was mine to take care of it. Um, and she was a student at the local university, and it's a longer story, but bottom line, she had gotten into alchemy. And for those who don't know, alchemy was the, was the medieval occult science of trying to trans, transmute lead into gold. And so the alchemists all wanted to get rich off of it. And so I, I pretty quickly kind of figured out, this ain't your garden variety of evil spirit. What is this thing? And I started talking to her. Turned out, even though she was studying metallurgical engineering, she had an alchemist spirit and she had actually turned lead into gold. And not only lead, some other you know, elements, stones and whatnot. So alchemy, astral travel, that's a big one. Let's, I put these in alphabetical order. Chiropractic, now I mentioned this a few minutes ago and left it hanging there. This was founded by a man named Daniel David Palmer in 1895. So it's about 135 130 years old. And by the way, he, un he got his understanding of, the, of what he called the science of chiropractic medicine from a ghost in a seance. Yeah. Again, fact check me. You can, you can look this up. I even have the reference in my notes here. I could click it, and if I had my wireless thing turned on, the page would come up. Chiropractic is founded on four key principles. Four. And I'm, I'm not going to go into any of the others at this depth, but chiropractic is so, so pervasive, I'm going to do it here. The first of them, I'm actually, I'm going to reorder these. The most virulent of them all is spiritualism, something we've returned to again and again as we've looked at the pages of the Old Testament. Spiritualism is a social religious movement according to which the laws of nature and of God include the continuity of personality after the transition of death and the possibility of communication between those living on earth and those who have made the transition to the afterlife. The afterlife, or the spirit world, is seen by spiritualists not as a static place but as one in which spirits continue evolving. These twin beliefs that contact with spirits is possible and that spirits are more advanced than humans lead spiritualists to a third belief that spirits are capable of providing useful knowledge about moral and ethical issues as well as about the nature of God. Of course, this means they are deceiving spirits because they are evil spirits and what they speak would not be correct. Some spiritualists will speak of a concept which they refer to as spirit guides, specific spirits frequently contacted who rely who are relied upon for spiritual guidance. Chiropractic medicine rests upon spiritualism as one of its core tenets. And I have spiritualism in red letters because it is absolutely a no-fly zone. That should be enough reason not to be involved in it. Okay, the next one is naturalism. And this is kind of almost, well, in a moment you'll understand why this is so paradoxical. But naturalism is the belief that only natural laws operate in the universe, that spirits, deities, and ghosts are not real. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, why would they believe that if they believe in spiritualism? And the answer is, this is Satan's age-old game. We're not here. I don't really exist. So he's putting out two mutually exclusive lies, figuring you'll bite on one or the other. <clears throat> But naturalism is a problem because it denies the reality of God. It is a godless philosophy, and it is empowered itself by the notion that there are no spirits or deities or ghosts. Well, that means there's no angels either. That means there's no four living creatures. And so it leads you into a sterile spiritual 
uh, environment. And for many people who get into this, they, they end up in bondage to that other side of the same problem. So we've got spiritualism against naturalism. Then we have vitalism. This is the belief, this is the third key tenet of chiropractic medicine, that living things are different from non-living things due to the vital spark, the life energy, or in French, the elan vital. And so what is the equivalent of that? It is none other than the force of Star Wars. Yeah. And so there is a belief in a non-personal force that can be channeled and directed, and this is part of the core tenet of good, true chiropractors. I know there are some who say, well, they taught us that in school, but I set all that aside. But part of the chiropractic induction process is you're taken through the ritual, and I don't think they lay hands on you to commission you, but you are invested with this special knowledge from Donald David Palmer. The fourth tenet, so all three of those are problematic, from the worst to the maybe least problematic. The fourth one, this one I think is neither here nor there. I'll just mention it so I, I'm complete in what I say. But I don't think this one is, at least at this point in my thinking, could change. I don't think this one is particularly a problem, but it, it's just part of the worldview, is magnetism. Now, magnetism is a class of physical attributes that are mediated by a magnetic field, and it refers to the, about the capacity to induce attractive or repulsive phenomena in other entities. So you can propel magnets away or attract them, depending on the way the poles are aligned. Magnetism is a pretty well understood dynamic within the field of physics. And um, magnetism occurs you know, with many different uh, substances. Some metals and rocks are more magnetic than others. But all, all beings, all creatures, all inanimate objects on some level exhibit magnetism. It may be very, very low, or it may be much, much higher. It just kind of depends. Um, in my mind, if you want to wear a magnetic bracelet or something and you think it's helping you with your rheumatism, <clears throat> I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. It's a little unusual, but it's a little bit like essential oils. I don't think there's anything specifically wrong with essential oils. You may spend a lot of money on them, and you, you, know, you may become dependent on something, and so there may not actually be a medical value to it. But are you going to get demonized? Maybe not. So the magnetism thing to me is neither here nor there. But the first three, definite no-fly zone. And we've seen many people get delivered of chiropractic treatments, although that always makes people shudder and it always creates a lot of work for me to say it. Conjuring, clairvoyance, which is the ability to see at distance. It's kind of like what we do as Christian prophets when we see things in a vision, um, but clairvoyance isn't relying on the Holy Spirit. It's relying on dark powers. Clairaudience, which is the ability to hear things at distance. So voyance has to do with seeing. We get the word voyeur from somebody who sees, and then audience, the ability to hear. Audeo is the Latin word for to hear. Crystal balls, divination, including divining rods, um, the arranging of organs from a, from a killed animal, maybe on a plate, uh, seeing how tea leaves fall in a cup, any or all, and there are other forms besides any kind of divination like that, including, by the way, divining rods. Now, you don't run into this too much here in California, but anyone who's from the Midwest or the Central Continent, you know, it looks like a Y and they hold it and the rod will turn down when you're over, you, what depends what you're looking for, a pipe, water, or oil. So divination of any kind is um, a strict no-fly zone. L got lots of stories on that one from my travels around the world, but no time. Fortune telling, Harry Potter, why? Harry Potter glorifies witchcraft. And it takes many people in the direction of, gee, I'd like to try that. And then they get their imagination spun up and they start questing for it. And there's always something out there that wants to you know, take you there. Mediumship and necromancy, the Ouija board, Wicca, yoga. Why yoga? Because yoga is Hinduism, as I already said. And generally speaking, people who get into yoga thinking it's going to help them with their sore back or their stiffness and that kind of thing, they generally end up worse because of this pay me now, pay me later phenomenon. And so I've caught all kinds of flack um, for saying that yoga is not okay. And there are some pretty prominent preachers that kind of run in our circles who say that it's fine. 
but I've driven spirits out of people all over the world. And if you talk to Indian Christians, and I, I mean dot, not feather, when you talk to Indian Christians, they know exactly what's behind yoga, and they will happily inform you. And they cannot believe that white Americans, and it is mostly whites, you know, in yoga tra track suits and yoga pants, drinking their latte and driving some, you know, suburban mom mobile, you know the profile. They can't believe that people are so stupid as to get involved in all this. And I've cast kundalini spirits out of people, and they tend to accumulate right in here uh, from the practice of yoga. And when that stuff is driven out, all of the things that they were doing yoga to get rid of go away and they don't come back. Because again, pay me now, pay me later. Is it a spiritual counterfeit or the real power of God? Okay, what are the risks of the occult? Sickness, insanity, and anxiety, and other mental afflictions. This is all found in Deuteronomy 28.65. 2865. There can be generational effects that pass down through your children and beyond, your grandchildren and so forth. And Deuteronomy 2864, you get into the occult, you will be scattered to the nations. That's exactly what we, I called it out when we were reading it in the Pentateuch, that the nations that are in the land are doing these things, and for this I am driving them out. So we could literally lose our country over this stuff. And so part of our spiritual warfare that we're doing is to make sure that America remains free and remains American. And so I hope that I've turned all of you into uh, strong opponents of the occult. All right, I'm going to quickly walk you through how to pray people out of it. All right, so you've got somebody who's been doing any or all. They need to acknowledge the occult practices. I did it. I own it. It was wrong. By the way, if it's in their parents or their grandparents, they did it and I own it and it's wrong. Why they did it and I own it? Because you are, you were in their loins when they were doing it, whoever you are, and you are confessing generationally the sins of your forefathers and foremothers. So we acknowledge it. Number two, confess said practices, whatever they may have been, as sin. And I always tell people to acknowledge that they violated the first commandment, that there is no other God beside the Lord. None. And so with that, they violated him. Then renounce the practices. Now, renunciation alone is never enough. A lot of people think that it is, but it's not. It's the first of a few other steps. So the third step is to renounce these practices. Step four, where it's appropriate and you can do it, destroy the objects that are related to these things. We see this um, modeled for us in the pages of the scripture, and I'm going to turn here. You don't need to because I want to finish this up. But in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says this. Um, no, I've got the wrong verse. Deuteronomy, here we go. Deuteronomy uh, 7, 5. So they will turn you away from following me to serve other gods. And then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and you would be destroyed quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. A lot of times people want to say, well, you know, it's beautiful art and I got it in Papua New Guinea and it's been great. I did get cancer after I brought it home, but aside from that. So this is one of the big things that is very unclear to most people. God wants his stuff destroyed. That's why Paul had them burning books in Ephesus. It's not that we're like culture warriors here. It's that this stuff is radioactive spiritually, and there's nothing you can do to decontaminate it and make it okay. So when people say, well, you know, I want to get married in the Masonic temple, so I'm just going to pray and bind the demons and decommission it, and then it'll be okay, right? And I'm like, no. Well, we can't find another place to get married. How about the public park? How about Refuge Church? I bet they'd be willing to let you get married here. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of these excuses. Here's another parallel passage, Deuteronomy 12.3. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. 
you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Well, there it is. So where appropriate, destroy the objects. Now I've seen this take a lot of forms. Masonic swords that we've had to melt down, Masonic rings that we couldn't melt for, couldn't get the fire hot enough, so we just get a big sledgehammer and smash it into pieces. I mean, it just sort of goes on and on. It depends on what people have. I remember ministering to a woman in Australia, and she had a carved table that had come out of the Masonic Lodge. Her husband was the lodge master and a 33rd degree mason, and she had all kinds of issues in her life. The husband was gone, and she also had a fur coat that she always wore to the Masonic meetings. And I said, um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and I want you to get some lighter fluid for the barbecue, and I want you to sprinkle it on the fur coat and light it on fire. She's like, but it's a chinchilla. I said, burn it. So she did that. And then the carved table that was probably as big as this rug, uh, I told her to get an ax. And she needed her grandson to come over and help her. But she literally chopped it into splinters with his help. And then we could minister to her and break her out of it. This is, this is the way it really rolls. OK, step five. Any occult spirits that are present that you identify, command them to leave by name and by function. The name may not be the function. So command them to leave both by name and by function. That all needs to get out. Okay. Um, ask for cleansing in the bloodline if it's appropriate. Now, if the parents and grandparents weren't doing it, I wouldn't be so worried. Um, and then break any bloodline curses having made the confession first. Break any bloodline curses, including diseases or heredi uh, inherited occultic powers. These things can be passed on, and so they need to turn away from that ability to foretell the future or divine or summon the dead or whatever it is, any or all. So they're literally getting away from that power that they have been given. And then you, as the prayer minister, command any spirits that enforce these curses to leave. And finally, command the spirit of death to leave because it will be present. So there's your basic prayer model on what to do when you <clears throat> run up against all this. 